Okay. Philippians 2. So remember last uh, week, basically chapter one is loaded. You know, he who began a good work, the song we sang or tried, you know, li listened to. Uh, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. We did that one where Paul talks about that. I know this working out my deliverance because we're not there yet. <coughs> Chapter two. Therefore, if you have any encouragement for me from your being in union with the Messiah. Remember, we talked about that last time about the body and the parts and pieces being united in harmony. Any comfort flowing from uh, what's that word? Any comfort flowing from what? Oh, that word keeps popping up, doesn't it? That word pops up over and over and over again. I don't think some people sitting in uh, places, synagogues and churches learning have actually really listened, <laughs> paid attention, <laughs> and understood and bothered to look it up and find out what does that word really mean. It's just a word we say. Mm. It's a word we say to get things. Isn't it? Mm. Any comfort flowing from, let me say, real love. Okay, true love. His love. Any fellowship with me in the spirit. Or any compassion and sympathy. Then complete my joy by having a common purpose. A common love. By being one in heart and mind. You know, we say, we say it every Shabbat morning. Love your neighbor as yourself. And I often say, maybe we need to love our neighbors better than ourselves. Because some of us don't know how to self-love either. And you know, that's actually an act of rebellion against God. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> no. Denying love, not loving yourself. Yep, not loving yourself. Because if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. Not caring about your body, not caring. Remembering you're a temple of you're you're a temple where the Holy Spirit is housed. So you're the temple of God. So how do we treat our bodies? Do we abuse? I mean, sometimes I go out and I work, and you know, and it's, it gets quite 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 abusive on this poor old body. That's not what I'm talking about. Things we deliberately do or don't do for our temples. Okay? It says, everything you do, do as unto the Lord. We need to remember, he's with us. Even if you shove him in the corner, he's still in the corner in your body. He's still with you. Right? He sees everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. He's fully aware. One of my favorite stories about seeing us where we are is the story of Ishmael when Hagar and Ishmael are sent away, right? And she doesn't want to see her son die, so she puts him under a you know a tree or a bush and walks away and goes and sits somewhere else because she can't stand the thought of watching her son die. And God talks to her and he says, I heard the boy. He doesn't go talk to Ishmael. Maybe he did. I don't know. But he's talking to the mama. And he said, I heard the boy where he is. See, he already knew Ishmael was what he was going to do in his adulthood because God sees all of time at the same time. He sees day one of creation and he sees the last day when his son comes. He sees all of those 6,000 years all at the same time. He's outside of time. It's kind of hard to fathom. So he knows every mistake you're going to make, every mistake you've already made, he knows every good you're going to do, and he knows whether you're going to follow him. Your choice. And he loves you anyway. So out of loving him back, he says, if you love me, you will obey me. Right? So at your stage of life, that means submitting to the authority of your parents. you got to think, um, the founding fathers of Israel, okay, Jacob and Esau were 40 years old when Jacob obeyed his parents to go to another land to find a wife. He was 40. 
That's mama's age. And she was obeying her parents. You see what I'm saying? So at your age, we have to learn a whole new idea of what obedience and submission is. Okay? So, um, and, and we, even in my 60s, even some in their 70s here, still learn new ways to obey still learn areas where we haven't submitted okay so it's a process it's a process but when i mess up and when i fail when i blow it because i'm going to blow it i'm a human being and what do i do when i blow it did you see what she did do it again first thing i do when i blow it think of adam and eve adam had a direct command adam had a direct command don't you can eat of any of the tree just don't eat of this one and God comes in the garden. He goes, where are you? Adam, he knew where he was. He wasn't asking for himself. He was asking for Adam and Eve. Where are you? My words. My words. Adam, hey, turkey, I know where you are. I know what you did. Would you come on out? It's okay. You screwed up. I know you did. Royally. You really did a big one. But that's okay. I love you. Come on out. I, I want to be with you. I, I've got a way. I have a plan. I'm going to take care of it. So anytime you blow it, nothing can be worse than that direct command of Adam that brought sin into the world. So if you blow it, Abba, I, Abba, I messed up. Help me. Clean me. Show me the path to get out of where I'm at. And he will save you. There's a, a psalm that says, and they cried out in their destructions, in their own doing, their own path, their own choices, and he delivered them from it. Okay? It's if you have a sincere heart. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. That was a good question. Oh, I hope it came through. I forgot what the question was. Oops. Got the mic. I got to remember to repeat the question. It was a great question, whatever it was, because the answer was good. That came from Abba, not me. So I can say that. <laughs> okay. So the question was, what do you mean when we don't love ourselves? Okay. That was a really good question. See where it led us? That was good. And we all. love yourself to be like people that are doing drugs. They're not loving themselves. Mm. Are you speaking from experience? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we all do it, right? Yeah. Okay. It. A what? poor diet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Diet, you know, bad decisions. I mean, mm -hmm. and you cannot perfect it either. You cannot say, I'm doing it right for the rest of my life because you're right. You're going to blow it. You're going to blow it. Big time. That was good. That was good. That was good. Okay. Gee, what verse are we on? <laughs> I need to have some kind of buy highlighter or something, you know, to I, I'd still lose myself. Whatever. Oh my goodness. Seriously? Okay. All right. A common person, a common love, being one in heart and mind. So that common love really means it, it means what do you need and how can I help you above me? Okay, so I'm gonna use moms. You know, moms make sure everybody's fed, everybody's clothes are clean, everybody's got it together. Who's the last one to get fed? Who's the last one to get ready? Who's the last one? Yeah, okay, that's love. That's love, okay? Okay, verse three. Well, don't forget, be one in heart and mind. That's where we get the term like-minded, right? Like-minded. So if somebody's not like-minded, maybe they have, maybe they're still on the path. Maybe they're still gods. They haven't gotten there yet. They haven't learned that yet. Or maybe they're not. It's a good indicator to really check. Okay. All right. 
Do nothing out of rivalry or vanity, but in humility regard each other as better than yourselves. I think we just said that. Oh, but look at that. Verse 3. Do nothing out of rivalry or vanity. Remember last week when I when we read um, verse 15 of chapter 1. True, some are proclaiming the Messiah out of jealousy and rivalry. And I told you, I don't get it. I don't understand. I do. But I really don't want to. What I really don't get and what I really don't understand is why? Why? So, you know, when you when when it says um, don't do anything out of rivalry or vanity, you know, you've heard it said of, of, of church. Well, how many is in your congregation? God doesn't care about the number. He cares about the heart. <clears throat> Let me ask you a different question. How many in your congregation are all in? Everyone here is all in. That's a much bigger, better number. That's 100% in my book. But it's not my book. It's not my perspective. It's not my eyesight. It's God's. Okay. You know, it says some are proclaiming the Messiah out of jealousy and rivalry. Right. But others are so it's not saying, you know, my church is bigger than your church or my our worship team is better than your worship team. That's not what it's saying. No. It's saying that they're proclaiming Messiah out of jealousy mm -hmm. and rivalry. So it would be more like... Um, This group saying, okay, Jesus is such and such, such, such and such. And another group saying, no, he's not. He's this, this, and this. Because it's... I think it's both. Talking about Messiah. Right. But I think it's both. Just. Because he's also actions, like in feeding the 5,000 or in feeding this. Mm -hmm. So because it says jealousy. Now, jealousy twists things. Yeah. So jealousy, they might be sharing a message. But they're doing the way they're going about it, and the way they're doing it is to get numbers out of jealousy. You see what I'm saying? Out of rivalry, out of jealousy. The motivation. So it's the motivation of the heart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, think about the hope that we're probably holier than you. You might have a lot more holes. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> um, um, think about the disciples. You know, before the full reveal, before he fully revealed himself after his resurrection, who's going to be the greatest? Or we want? I want my sons to sit at your left and your right. Okay, that that's not one mind. That's not unity in spirit. That's not love. Right? Okay. So we have lots of examples. And again, I say, y you, you're, you're so close. You're so close. Just, I don't know. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Want to know, you know? Okay. Are we at four yet? Now? Look out for others' interests, not just for your own. Oh, we, t we, d we did say that, right? Okay, verse 5. Let your attitude toward one another be governed by your being in union with the Messiah, Yeshua. You know, that's the bottom line. If we could just get that straight, everything would fall into place. If we would just understand how we're united, how he lives in, in us, his spirit is in us, and we are all one, it would get a little easier, I think. Yep. Knocking off myself. Oh, wait a minute. There's self. Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, there was more sherry. <laughs> right? True story, unfortunately. Verse 6. Though he was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God, something to be possessed by force. Okay, moving on. Right? I mean, so let's, let's look at it. This is the Greek. Can you see that? who although he existed in the form of God, 
did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. It kind of sounds a little contradictory there, doesn't it? But you know, my we see it in marriage. The wife is not less than the husband. But they should act as one. They should be in unity. Form, do you see the Greek word under the word, English word, form? The Greek word is morph. morph. I was thinking change. morph is changing into. Yeah. Into. It's form. But that may not have been what it meant then. Morph, Greek. The form by which a person or thing strikes the vision, external appearance. To be a metamorphosis means there's been a change in form. Okay? Morph is not change. Morph is form. But a metamorphosis is a change in form. Like a butterfly does metamorphosis. Changes one form from a caterpillar into a butterfly. Okay? So that's what you're thinking of. But the Greek word morph or morphe is the form by which a person uh, their external appearance. Basically what it's telling you here, let me go back uh, to this word. In the Hebrew, there's the word image. Okay? But if you look at, in Genesis, there's two words. One which is like morph, our likeness, and one is our image. So if we are in the image of God, that means we're his representatives. In nature and spirit, we are to be his representatives. It doesn't mean a physical Okay, whereas what they're saying here is physically, he was, he's physically God. Yes. They did not regard, regard as equality with God something to be possessed by force. Right, meaning he didn't have to say, I am, or he didn't have to prove himself. He didn't have to grab it down here because he knew down here he took on, well, let's read the next verse. Let's add the next verse to it. On the contrary, he emptied himself. God emptied himself and took the form of a slave by becoming like human beings are. Very clear. They knew what the plan was. God knew the plan. God understood what was needed. Only God could make a way and make us righteous. We can't do it. No man can do it. But a fully man, fully God could set aside his Godhood, not denying it, not being without it, setting it aside, submission to the Father, in coming in a human form, because that was what was required by the law. That was what was required to make us in right standing with him. That's how much he loved us. That's love. Where a man gives himself for someone else. In this case, God. God, man. Gave himself for us. That's love. You can't, can't, you can't out-love that. <laughs> can't outdo that. All you can do is strive to be like that. So, if that means you have to give up something of yourself to serve someone else, oh, now you're being like Yeshua. Now you're being Christ-like. Now you're being like Mashiach. I want, I'm going to, okay, set, I'm going to set aside my want, my desire, what I was going to do for the day. Instead, this is what I'm going to do. Don't think I'm talking to you all. I'm not. Where's the mirror? <laughs> oh, right here in front of me. <laughs> I can see myself. So though he was in the form of God, though he was God, he did not regard equality, regard something to be uh, possessed by force. On the contrary, he emptied himself in that he took on the form of the lowest being, below the angels. By becoming like human beings are. Okay? Um, to be grasped by force 
basically one of the words in there is grass means um, to be retained. In other words, I'm not going to hold on to my godliness. I'm going to submit in a human form. Not necessarily a word we would have looked there had I not looked at the Greek. Okay. All right. And when he appeared as a human being, he, hum he humbled himself even more. I mean, wasn't it enough that he walked on the earth as a human being? No. He humbled himself even more by becoming obedient even to death. And not just any death. Death is a criminal according to the law. Cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree. What? Cursed is anyone who hangs on the stake. Didn't Moses give us an idea of that by putting the serpent on the stake? You had to look at it and believe and trust. It wasn't the serpent. Okay? It wasn't the serpent. That's not what saved him. Only Yeshua on the stake saves. Death on a stake is a criminal. Therefore, God raised him to the highest place <laughs> and gave him the name above every name. Uh, I got news for you. He was in that place before at creation. 10, that in honor of the name given Yeshua, okay, hold on to your hats, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will acknowledge that Yeshua the Messiah is at an eye to the glory of God the Father. Who do we, you know, scripture is very clear. You don't bow down to only one. Who do you bow down to? God. Only God. And him only will you serve. And yet, doesn't it clearly state here? That in honor of the name given Yeshua. What does Yeshua mean? God is salvation. Every knee will bow. In heaven. On earth. And under the earth. Did you ask something? Yes, because they're going to be, because on the last day of, of the resurrection, the second resurrection, you want to be on the first? Okay, if you die, make sure you're in the first resurrection. <laughs> on the second resurrection, everyone will be alive and they will face judgment and they will bend the knee. They will bow and every tongue will confess. Everyone who's ever lived will bow and confess every single one what a horrible day that would be to find out that you're going to eternal separation from God wow I don't want to wake up to that so strive like Paul to work out your deliverance to make it to the goal right yeah every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will acknowledge that Yeshua the Messiah is at an eye to the glory of God the Father. And by the way, um, that's in Isaiah. Okay? That's in Isaiah, that every knee will bow and every tongue confess. That's out of Isaiah. So, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed when I was with you, it is even more important that you obey now when I am away from you. Keep working out your deliverance with fear and trembling. There it is again. What did he say? Keep working out. Right? Keep working out. Huh? Keep doing. Keep doing. What does the Lord require of you? Why do we always go back to that? Because it's foundational. Act justly. It doesn't mean put on an act. It means be, do, act justly. Be justly, okay? Walk justly. Love mercy. Chesed. Chesed. And walk humbly with your God. Hum, hum, humility is not being a weakling. Humility is not um, possessing any, you know, being unable. Humility is walking under, what do I, what do I want to say? Thank you. I may have abilities. They come from him. I may 
have knowledge because I'm a perpetual student. I just, that's who, how we wired my brain. That doesn't make me smarter than someone else or have more common sense than someone else. Or he can use any of us. Walking humbly with your God, knowing who you are in Yeshua. Let's know who we are. And then let's walk in it. And let's recognize that all good gifts and every perfect gift comes from him. Right? Along with humility, I always want, I, I, I don't know why, but I always want to marry humility and meekness together. Because meekness is strength under control. Meekness means I have, you know, strength. I have the power. I could flip this table over. I could. But I'm not going to. It's not what's best. It's not what. So to me, humility and meekness go hand in hand, knowing who I am in him and what I can and maybe should not do. Okay? I, I don't know why I've always put those two together, but I always put those two together. And they're two different things, but they do go hand in hand because you cannot be meek if you're not humble. There's, you you can't because you, you won't recognize where your limits stop and his start. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. I think it's that if you're in a situation where you feel like you've been wrong, okay, keep your mouth shut. Yep. Be quiet, and God will take care of it. Yep, He will. You don't have to say anything. He will. You don't have to fight back. You don't have to get angry. Right. You don't have to stew about it. Right. Or, or dwell on it. Right. Let it go. I wish I had walked over the there. What does it mean to turn the other cheek? In order to do that, you almost have to have gotten slapped already. Right? <laughs> right. Turn the other cheek means that you got to get slapped again and then you smack them? <laughs> so what does it mean? You got two more cheeks. You're looking like that. That's really hard, right? Of course, I might be kicking you by then, not slapping you, but hey. <laughs> I wish I had the microphone over there for you. Um, yes, some people see meekness as weakness. Uh, my father was a wonderful example of somebody who was meek. You would have no idea when you met my father that he could take two six-foot grown men down single-handedly. Because he was five foot four and he was very humble and very meek. Maybe that's why I put them together because he was my example. But he could because I saw two grown six foot tall men um, beating up and harassing a grandma and he was having none of it. That's why he just anger. So, you know, at that point, yeah, at that point, he did what he was supposed to do. You do he was going to defend her, and he did. And they went running out of the house. So, yeah, people do see meekness as weakness, and they walk over you. Maybe they they would. I, I missed. I, I'm not sure we picked up what you said, but sometimes you said you said if somebody wrongs you, keep your mouth shut. God will take care of it. Did I sum that up? Pretty close. Okay. And and I agree with you wholeheartedly. There may come a point in time because there's another verse that says every weapon that is formed against you will not prosper. You will bring into correction. Wait for it. Don't make it happen. Okay? Wait for it. No. <laughs> don't help God. No. Don't help God. God does not help those who help themselves. Well, he might, but not in this circumstance. No. Um, no. And and say, hey, God, I got yeah oh yeah yeah I got it see okay so remember his I got I got it God I got it God those will be one of those times you'll be going oh God <laughs> I messed up <laughs> I was walking in my own flesh in my own strength and the scripture says you might find you might have another cheek back here Alfred. <laughs> Slap you upside the head. Okay. Um, wow. 
if he tells you to bring it into Christ. So I'm going to use, for example, I'm going to go back to the nonprofit. I got, I, you got to use real life to, to make it tangent, to make you understand. So I'm going to go back to the meeting with the nonprofit that was, you know, here a few, a month or so ago. And something had happened in October last year. And I kept my mouth shut. And I have kept my mouth shut all this time. But in that meeting, someone else popped up, spouted off, and spewed lies regarding it. And I answered, just, I'm sorry, that blah, 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 you know, surfacy, and stopped. And then God's like, "Uh uh-uh, you're going to speak. All right. Yeah, I want you to say, okay, well, God, they've moved on. So you're going to have to open that door again, because if I do it right now, it's going to seem really petty and you want your message to come. Through. So I sat there and I waited. And within five, 10 minutes, the conversation came right back. And I spoke the truth about the situation. Okay, so wait until he tells you to. And maybe he won't tell you to. Maybe he'll tell you just to bite your tongue and swallow the blood. Okay. It's doing it his way from his perspective. But don't go to bed angry. If I'd have been harboring anger on that from October, I would, I'd, I'd be sick in bed still today. Or maybe not even, maybe I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> anger will destroy you. Yeah. Anger will make you sick. So be angry and sin not. Deal with your anger. Don't let the sun go down. Okay? There's a balancing in there. So, and the only way we can do that is by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us and asking him, okay, how do I do this? And, and sometimes we're going to learn by experience. We're going to learn by doing. We're going to learn by falling. We're going to learn by, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do all these old people in the room have to say to the young people in the room? Oh, okay. So you can learn from the mistakes of the old people in the room. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm in that camp. <laughs> older <laughs> older okay so there's a lot of ways to learn okay a lot of ways to learn that was good okay where are we now <laughs> are we okay oh nope we didn't do 13 okay all right all right all right working out your deliverance with fear and trembling at the end of 12 13 for God is the one working among you, both the willing and the working for what pleases him. Oh, there's so many ways to go on that one. Both the willing and the working. You know, sometimes we're willing and sometimes we're not. And sometimes we work unwillingly. Did you hear me? Sometimes you work unwillingly. Am I still obeying? Yeah. Well, you know, I know obedience is doing. Okay, come on, Zimmy Zariah, help me out. Obedience is doing uh, exactly what you're told when you're told with a happy, submissive spirit. Yeah, or heart, or heart. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, sometimes we walk through obedience and maybe our heart isn't necessarily there. Okay. I know I'm, t- I'm telling you something contrary to what I taught you, right? Eventually your heart will catch up as adults. Eventually your heart will catch up. It's like forgiveness. You choose to forgive. Your heart doesn't necessarily always want to, or isn't necessarily all in it. It's a choice. Obedience is the same way. Obedience is a choice. Okay, but we want to get to the place where we do it willingly with a happy, submissive spirit. I'll share something funny. Okay, I'm going to come over there so I can catch it. <laughs> so, I've probably shared this with you before. But you might have. This is just a little thing, but it really illustrates what Sherry's talking about. Okay, my husband used to take a bath every day. Yes. And I absolutely hated it because he used soap and the bath was always scummy. So I had to scour that bathtub every single day. I hated it. 
I used to just cuss while I was doing it. I remember you not liking God it. God <laughs> convicted me that I was to begin to be grateful for everything, even a nasty, dirty bathtub. Gummy bathtub. I had to clean every day. So, even though I didn't feel like it and it wasn't in my heart, every day, every morning when I cleaned that bathtub, I started thanking God for number one, that my husband was a good provider. Number two, that I had the comet to clean the bathtub with. <laughs> number three, that I had water to do it. Just, you know, just every day, every day. It took about three weeks and I was really grateful. It was, it was God changed my heart because I, in obedience, I began to thank him even though I wasn't thankful. Okay. And he changed my heart. That's right. So that's what you can do. It doesn't matter. Even if you have a teacher you can't stand that you think is so unfair. Sorry. Just begin to <laughs> thank God for any and every little thing that you can think of. And just keep doing that. And he will change your heart. He will transform your mind. Yeah. He'll yeah. renew your mind. Okay. And your heart. So I remember that. That was a long time ago. <laughs> yep. No, that was good. That 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 was a good illustration. Thanks for sharing it. So um. So even though the definition I taught you was obedience is doing exactly what you're told when you're told with a happy submissive spirit, sometimes obedience isn't always done exactly when I tell you to do it. Or with a happy submissive spirit but you choose to do it anyway that's still obedience okay so when you fall short of some of it okay help me show me help me and then do as miss linda said find things to be grateful for i'm going to say it again gratitude is an attitude okay gratitude is an attitude and if you are grateful your attitude is going to change Okay, it will. It, it will. I'm telling you, if you start speaking gratitude, your heart will change. Your physical ailments will change. Your outlook will change. Your spirit will lighten. Test it. Prove me wrong. <laughs> okay? Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Oh, I love a challenge. Do you love a challenge? Prove me wrong. Yeah. No, I, don't. <laughs> I do. I do. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. All right. Good luck with that, by the way. Proving me wrong, that is. In that regard. Okay. All right. <laughs> hey, when it's God's word, go ahead, baby. Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Prove it wrong. <laughs> oh my goodness. And then what's the very next verse? Oh, what? Did you know that that was the next verse? <laughs> Do everything. Okay, so Zimmy, Zariah, guess what? Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Goes with your story. You learned to clean that scummy well, bathtub ring. Well, before. before, before, but you learn to stop grumbling, right? Okay, I'm telling you. Yeah. Is obedience because there are other people in your lives that are authority figures that you maybe need to have have um yes say it dad's, you know okay right before you act in obedience right because there's a lot of evil people out there that would like to lead you astray and so oh to be that's a i'm glad you said that thank you well, okay well that's true so i want to teach you guys something Okay, the three of you. Not every adult. Okay. Um, 
let me start with husbands and wives. Okay, it says wives are to submit to your husbands. Does that mean any man that tells me something to do, I need to do what that man says to do? No, no not on your life. They don't have authority over me. Okay, unless I'm, you know, if it's my boss. Right? You know, unless he has a position of authority that I'm a subject under, you know, a king and a subject or something like that, okay? Um, children obey your parents. That doesn't mean you obey every adult, okay? You can respectfully disagree. And it was a young man, his father, they were this, where they, they do the, the dog sleds. Um, and his father passed, and this young, they were going to lose the farm, so he was going to run this race, and he was like 12 or 13. So he was the youngest one ever to do it. So he runs the race, but there were men that are trying, because they're men, and they're conniving and evil and twisted, and they're trying to stop him. And he stands up. And they're like, no, you're a boy. You have to do what I say. I respectfully disagree. Okay? You can stand your ground. So what I said before you got out here is that they don't have to obey adults. They have to obey their parents. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean if an adult comes by, you know, like Janet told you last week, if you're standing on the corner and there's a car coming, she's going to grab you or scream at you to get out of the way. You need to listen to that. Okay? That's wisdom. But... Somebody comes along and says, oh, here, come over and help me do this. I'm looking for my last dog. Oh, no, turn around and go the other way. You have a teacher that tell, wants you to do something, to read a book that you know your parents would not approve of. That's right. You don't have to do that. How did we get, that was good. That was good. So, so we have to be very wise, even as youth, if it's, if it's, According to God's word, then that's what we do. Now, let's say we have, let's say you had parents, your parents say something to you and you're thinking, I, I think that's contrary. There's a way to approach it. Okay. You can go and say, first, I would go in, into your prayer closet and you and Abba talk. Okay. <laughs> then you go and say, okay, can I, I understand what you're saying? You're my parents. I'm going to do what you tell me to do. But I'm having a conflict because I read this. And maybe they're going to tell you, okay, but what you don't see is something. And they'll, ex and maybe they'll explain it to you. Or maybe they might say to you, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. Parents can say they're wrong. Oh, guy, I can't tell you how many times I was told as a parent, you'll never tell your child you're wrong. Oh, please. Oh, my goodness. Or you might hear, I understand what you're saying, son. But there are things I can't explain to you right now, and I need you to do this. What are you going to do? You're going to submit, okay? Because scripture is also very clear. If the daddy's wrong or the mama's wrong, it's on them, okay? You don't want that wrath on you, okay? So they've got a heavier responsibility. So there's three ways to respond, okay? Three different ways, three, three different responses you'll get, okay? They'll hear you out. Um, okay, yep, I was wrong. Or there's things you don't understand. And I can't explain it to you. I need you to do this. Or maybe they'll say, I hear you. Do this. Maybe they won't even explain it to you at all. They won't even say to you, there are things I know. I can't explain it to you. They're just going to say, I, I hear you. This is what I'm asking you to do. Okay? okay. Oh, oh, well, let me repeat 14. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without defect. Wow. I was born with defects. All that means is something that's not right. Okay? A defect is something that's not right. In the midst of a twisted and perverted generation. I wonder when Paul wrote this. Well, it's still twisted and perverted. I mean, seriously. Yeah, I know. Did he have a glimpse into the 2023? Oh my gosh. You you know what I'm saying? And I mean, you know, and I and I sit sometimes in prayer I'm like, "Oh god, how long?" I think sometimes what are 
Yeah. You know, <laughs> because life is so different. It's blatant. Yeah. Yep. And now it's so blatant. I mean, the things that are so blatant, I think maybe if we had someone from a few generations ago, no, I'm not saying that's not what we do. I'm just, if they saw what we see, what the billboards, the what comes on the radio, the television, the internet, they'd be going, whoa! Somebody draw the curtains. Do you know what draw the curtains means? <laughs> Close the window. Yeah, you know, I mean, cover it up. Turn it off. Okay? It, it, the, the things that you're bombarded with blow my mind. How things, and they're subtle changes because they're, they're subtle. You, some people. Wait, because they can see the time. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's true. That's why I said we need to be burned. We've been too complacent. To uh, yeah. 15, so let me go back to 15. So that you may be blameless and pure children of God without defect in the midst of a twisted and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the sky. As you hold on to the word of life. Isn't that wonderful? Who's the word of life? Okay, so you can be, you hold on to the word of life in everything. Doesn't mean you're teaching somebody. Doesn't mean you're evangelizing somebody. You can be in the grocery store, but you're going to be walking and moving and behaving and living in the manner of Yeshua. Blessed are, you know, when I said to you, blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. That doesn't mean you're answering them with scripture. It just means you're living the life that according to this, and they're gonna go. Well, what's you know what's the matter with you, Goody Two Shoe? Yeah. Or you know what what? And okay, so we we do it anyway because they will stand without excuse on the last day. They will stand without excuse because there was a light, there was a star shining, showing the way. Okay, isn't that what this says? You will shine like stars in the sky. As you hold, hold on to the word of life. If you do this, Paul says, if you, because I've taught you, right? You're basically my children. If I've taught you. Oh, oh darn. Let's <laughs> clarify. <laughs> oh, bummer. Dad, who taught you to read on? <laughs> oh. So, yes, if you do this, I will be able to boast when the day of Messiah comes that I did not run or toil for nothing. Oh, please, let me not have done all this for nothing, right? Indeed, even if this is Paul, you remember Paul's in prison, he's in Rome, this is it for him, okay? Even if my lifeblood is poured out as a drink offering over the sacrifice and service of your faith, I will still be glad and rejoice with you all. Did you see that? With you. I will rejoice with you. Likewise, you too should be glad and rejoice with me. But he's in chains. He's in prison. Gratitude is an attitude. I still have one more day to proclaim Yeshua. I can write this letter and encourage you. There's always something. Okay? But I hope in the Lord Yeshua to send Timothy to you shortly so that I too may be cheered by knowing how you are doing. That's humanist. You, you know, no text message. Okay. More than a week to get a letter to somebody and way more than a week or a month or a year to get a response back. We want and we want it now. Hmm. I have no one who compares with him, who will care so sincerely for your welfare. That's a good leader to identify the next generation, to sow into them, to raise them up, to teach them so that they can stand and shine and do likewise, right? Okay. So he trusts Timothy as himself. People all put their own interests ahead of the Messiah Yeshua. 
but you know his character, that like a child with his father, he slaved with me to advance the good news. So I hope to send him just as soon as I see how things will go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that before long, I myself will come along too. He's hoping, right? He has, he's trusting that God's going to do the best thing, but he'll submit either way. And we know he doesn't get to, does he? Yeah. Also, this part's really interesting to me. Also, I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier. It's a war. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle. The emissary whom you sent to take care of my needs. Not one of the original 12. No. Since he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, close to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me. Otherwise, I would have had sorrow piled on sorrow. Why? Because Paul would have said, oh, you sent him to me from you. You sent him to me from yourselves to take care of me. He got sick and he died. That would that would have hurt Paul. Because now you sent him to help me and here he's he's gone. That adds my sorrow because you're sorrowed and I can't comfort you far away because you're over there. Do you, do you see this? His concern was I would be sorrowful because I wouldn't be able to help you get over this because this is a valuable person, right? Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him so that you may rejoice when you see him again. And I, for my part, may be less sad because I want you to see your brother again. I, you, I want you to be reunited. See, Paul's thinking of somebody else's needs. He's in prison. This man can still do him great good and help him. But I don't want to be sad knowing that you're, you're, you're unhappy and you're missing him. So I want him to come back to you. Putting the needs of others. So give him a joyful welcome in the Lord. Honor such people. For he risked his life and nearly died working for the Messiah. Did you hear that? He risked his life and nearly died working for the Messiah. What work was he doing for the Messiah? Oh, glad you asked. In order to give me the help that you weren't in the position. He was helping me. He was a helper. You know, you're thinking, oh, did he go off to Africa and was he a missionary? You know, where there was witchcraft and this and that. No, he was coming and serving me. That's a great work. Thank you. It's a great work. And in Israel. Oh, God bless you. Thank you. <laughs> she, oh, she, I dropped something. She just pick it up and off we go. Out of thought. No comma. No her perfect, wonderful, beautiful attitude. It, fantastic traveling companion. We did great. No rivalry. No jealousy. No rivalry. No jealousy. No matter what we do. Even when she volunteers me to take some person into... <laughs> Caregiver. She had a caregiver. So I'm I'm over here. She's over here, and I'm over here because we're across the room from each other. And she was without her caregiver. She was over here. I was doing some, I was teaching somebody how to crochet or something. I don't know what. And we were the life of the party there. And she didn't have her caregiver and she's hooked up to the poles, just like Jenna said and all this. I'm repeating it for this because it was good. It was good. And she needed to go to the bathroom and she said something and Janet and her were talking and Janet goes, oh, sure, you'll take you. The room got dead quiet. I mean, it's a packed room. The dead got good. And everybody looked at me like, oh, I mean, you could hear gas. like. Oh, <gasps> you know, 
she just, oh, okay, you're going to do it? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. It's foreign to other people. It's just second nature. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But she could volunteer me, and so I was her. And like, but we had a like minded, focused, same goal. Okay? Putting the needs of other people above ourselves. Okay? That's unity. That's harmony. That's love. That's what Paul's talking about. Okay? Having a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. mm, having a servant's heart. Mm. Having a servant's heart. And then one day, one day, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And until that day, let us strive to work out our deliverance. Let us strive to be obedient. So when you obey and your heart's not in it, it's okay. Your heart will, you just say, help me to, help me to do this better. Help me to have a good attitude. Okay. And then the next time it'll be easier. And the next time maybe you will have a grateful heart. Okay. So that's why I'm in the mind of Christ because if we didn't both have the same, the mind of Christ, we wouldn't think that way. Right. The people that don't have the mind of Christ say, it's just their mind's not worked out. Right. And having the mind of Christ, being like-minded, what protects that mind? That's right, the helmet of salvation. And you put it on every day, right? Mm -hmm. Helmet of salvation. Protect the mind of Christ. My mind that is being transformed and renewed, right? Shalom. Grace and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Shalom. Grace and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. We pray for your family. We pray for your home. We pray for your children and generations to come. May the Lord bless you and keep you all your days. May his favor shine on your face all your days. May he lift up his countenance, the glory of his grace. May his favor rest on you all your days. Shalom. Grace and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Virecha Adonai, Vishmarecha, Yaher Adonai, Benevelecha. Vihuneka, Yisai Adonai, Panavalecha, Vishnam Ha, Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Remember, in that way, his name will be put upon you.